Welcome. On behalf of the Southern California Writers Association, I'd like to welcome everyone today to our pub shop with Dave Chesson, the Kindle Printer. Uh, and Dave's going to be sharing his insight and experience on book sales and what authors need to know. So welcome, Dave. Thank you guys for having me. Uh, do you want to start out and tell us, you, you were telling me a little bit before, but a little bit about yourself so that everybody has an idea of what your background is and um, how long and what you, or how you're involved in book sales. Sure. Well, I really got my career started uh, when I was in the military. Uh, I was deployed in South Korea. Uh, I was working on a South Korean base, so there was no other Americans there. And my wife and I had this very important discussion where she asked me what my, my goal in life was. Um, I was without my children. I had been without my children and my wife for a very long time, uh, thanks to military deployment. And uh, the truth was, I didn't want to be an admiral. I wanted to be home. I wanted to be home with my kids. And when you're on the other side of the world, it's really hard to build some business or an exit strategy. Uh, that's when I really got turned towards finally writing the books that I had wanted to write. And but the problem is someone like me, I'm not an Ernest Hemingway. I was never raised that way. I'm, I'm still not that at all either. Uh, so how does someone like me be able to grow their author career as well as improve their writing and start to build something that allows you to finally get home uh, to be with your kids? And so that was from taking up writing every day. Uh, I get up at 4.30 every morning and write until seven until I had to go into work. And that was my routine. Uh, but more importantly, something that was very important for me was trying to understand why does, Mar why does Amazon work the way it does? Uh, I could write a great book, but what do I need to do to get Amazon to decide to show my book more often to their shoppers? Um, what could I change? Uh, why did they choose one book over another? And when I started to really analyze and dig into this, I started to discover a lot of really important key metrics and things that basically make Amazon tick the way it does. And when I started doing that and adding it to my books, it's what really allowed me to start making uh, the sales that I needed to be able to get out of the military and be home. So fast forward a couple of years later, and here I am in Nashville uh, with my kids, just got home and they're upstairs. Uh, waiting to go play catch after this. So uh, very blessed in that respect. I also created Kindlepreneur.com, my website, um, teaching people about the book marketing tactics that I've employed over the years. Um, I'm a very analytical kind of person, so I really like to look at numbers and try to decide what's going on. Because the truth is, Amazon is an adapting beast. It's always changing, uh, and most of the time for the good. But I like to stay on top of it. Oop, you're muted. Sorry. Sorry about that. I'm not sure I thanked you properly enough uh, and welcomed you warmly enough because we're so excited to have you here, um, particularly because we do have uh, a few first time authors, people who are considering uh, publishing their books on Kindle, as well as people who have already published multiple books on Kindle. So maybe we could start out a little bit um, from your perspective. What do you think authors need to know um, when they're entering the world of uh, digital book sales? Well, when it comes to the digital age, uh, the key is, is that these online stores are trying to take inputs about your book and trying to figure out exactly where to put it. Um, let's go to a traditional standpoint, right, where you walk into a Barnes and Noble and they take a book and they decide where they put the book, uh, which shelf, which section. Is it spine out? Is it cover out? Is it at the end of the, of the aisle? Is it right at the front door when you walk in? These are all different spots, and if it's if it's not spying out, you know, if it's in the back of, of some shelf, you know, you're never even if it's a great book, nobody's ever going to buy it. So, what that makes Barnes and Noble move the book where it's cover facing forward, or cut, or your book at the end of the aisle, or at the front of the store? They're taking things into into mind. And now in the digital age, there's even more to this that helps these stores, these online stores like Amazon, Barnes & Noble, uh, Kobo, iTunes, all of them try to figure out how and where we should put the book. Because for those stores, the most important thing to them is, well, make more money. Uh, and so how do we get the right book in front of the right shopper? Because when we do that, we not only make more money, we also make our customers happier and they keep coming back to us. And you know, um, that is one of the biggest thing that's, uh, that Jeff Bezos talks about every time he talks about his store on Amazon is, we, we're not in the business of selling more stuff, we're in the business of making ha customers happier. 
So um, when it comes to the market, there's really two major ways that authors can influence Amazon's initial decision on how to show your book. And what I'm about to talk about is also important for the other markets as well, but we're gonna focus on Amazon because Amazon is about 70% of all book sales uh, in the United States. So it really is um, the behemoth and tailoring just a bit to them uh, is important, but it can also be used for those other markets. So those two things are the keywords that you enter and the categories you select. Uh, these are two very direct ways that you can influence Amazon's initial decision. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share screen here. We're gonna jump into a bit of a presentation uh, to discuss those two very important aspects. Um, can I verify that you can see my screen, Maddie? Okay, great. Uh, nope, I hit the share button. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> present, there we go. All right, so we're still good? Great, we're gonna talk about book discoverability um, and there's really three steps to, to keywords themselves. The first is identify the keywords. You need to figure out which keywords you want your book to target. Then you need to convince Amazon to sh show your book for that keyword. And then more importantly, you need to then improve the ranking so that you're at the top for more shoppers to see your book. To show exactly why rankings are important for keywords, if your book ranks number one for a certain keyword, 27, this is on average, 27% of people that typed in that keyword will click on your book. If you rank number two, 12% will, and then nine, eight, seven, six, and six. So rankings are a very important component to being discovered. To take this even further, the number one book gets two times more clicks than the number two book. And if we use some numbers, say for example, somebody types in, um, people on Amazon type in Space Marine a thousand times per month. Then if your book ranks number five, that means you only get 70 people who click on your book. But if you rank number one, 270 people will click on your book. And that's every month. So uh, just kind of a key understanding of that particular point. So getting back to what makes keywords important, again, it's you need to identify the words, Convince Amazon to index, which is an, a, a fancy word for have your book show up at some point. And then finally, if you're ranking so that you're right there at the top and you benefit from the clicks. Now, a lot of people say that when you're talking about this sort of thing, um, the how can you know, right? Amazon doesn't make this information public. And so what's really interesting is I've written a bunch of articles and a lot of the information here actually um, being compiled from articles I have done and Amazon Kindle Direct Publishing themselves have told people to gain insight from this optimization and also to use these especially for fiction. Um, as a matter of fact this bottom section down here uh, after I wrote my article on how to choose keywords for fiction books Amazon actually changed their FAQ to reflect exactly what I wrote um, which I thought was really fun and it was really cool that they also acknowledged it in social media that they did it so so what exactly are keywords, right? This is really important when you're trying to figure out, you know, what words do you put in those seven boxes when you go to publish your book? And the words, they're not these magical hacks. They're actually the words your shopper uses when they think of their ideal book. That's the best way to think of a keyword, okay? It's not this thing. It's when I sit down on amazon.com and I think of that fiction book I wanna read, what words come to mind to describe it? Now, nonfiction and fiction are extremely different beasts. Uh, nonfiction is really about pain points and problems, the results and solutions someone wants, the emotional aspect of why they're here searching for that book, and the demographics or how they identify themselves. Okay, a great example of this is that uh, some people say the keyword is stop smoking, right? I'm writing a book on how to quit smoking. But a lot of times when a shopper is looking for it, they start writing it in the pain points, you know, um, prevent lung cancer, uh, you know, increase social, um, you know, acceptability, uh, stop smoking, you know, my family wants me to stop smoking. Uh, even more so, we can put in demographics where maybe this person is young, maybe this person is old and they've been smoking for a long time. We don't really know. 
Um, another great example of this is somebody once wrote a book on going, that book did not do well because it didn't talk about why somebody's going back to school. It didn't talk about the demographic of who's going back to school. Cause like, is this person going back for their GRE? Is it for their college degree? Is it for their master's degree? Um, you know, are they young? Are they going up the corporate ladder or are they retired and looking for something? All of those things are completely different. All of those should be different books. So the key is, is that you really need to think about your nonfiction keywords as in describing pain points, problems, results, solutions, emotions, and demographics. With fiction, on the other hand, it's not describing a pain point somebody has. It's actually describing the type of story they want. Um, the way people usually do this is a combination of phrases and words that comprise of these four elements that I like to talk about, which is time periods and settings, character types and roles, plot themes and special events, and style and tone of genre. All right. Um, and I guess we can kind of, I don't remember if I have more on that, but the time periods and settings, uh, you know, is it Western? Is it, uh, you know, the Middle Ages? Is it modern? Uh, is it New York City? These things are very important. If I told you Caribbean, you're probably thinking of a couple of potential things. I could be talking about pirates or I could be talking about, you know, a murder mystery. Um, but it gives you a little bit more of the context of the story. Pirates in the, in the Mediterranean are different from pirates of the Caribbean, you know. Um, a murder mystery in the Caribbean is already a different story than a murder mystery in New York. You can see that just adding that component really changes the kind of story and it also changes a lot of what the person's expecting. Character types and roles are very important because in character types we're talking about you know our character and who they are. Is it a single mom? Is it a uh, Amish person? Is it a one-armed man? Uh, you know is it uh, someone with superpowers. Um, and you can go even further. Let's talk about um, magicians, like, or men who can conduct magic. You got magicians, sorcerers, mages, necromancers. I mean, the list goes on. And every, if you're a fantasy person, every one of those I just listed is an incredibly different story. A necromancer is so much different than a magician, right? Um, so how do we describe our character roles and their types? Uh, plot themes and special events can be like what's going on in the background. Is it a war? Is there, is it survival? Is it a kidnapping? Um, is it, you know, a gruesome murder that somebody's trying to find? And the ways that we describe these can be very different. And finally, and most importantly, I call it the style and tone of a genre. Um, let's just stick with one, which is romance, right? We can go from left to right from steamy value. Uh, romance can start from something that's wholesome and Christian and move all the way over to erotica. And there's 50 different shades of describing it. Sorry, I couldn't help myself with that uh, uh, bit of a pun, but you, you get what I'm saying. There's so many different ways. And let me tell you, a wholesome Christian romance reader does not want to end up picking up a book and finding out it's erotica or vice versa. You know, a person who's going for a hot and steamy romance is going to be mad when it's a mild-mannered, you know, uh, Christian romance. So imagine, I'm sure you can imagine that when somebody is searching for a romance, the style and tone is going to be a part of it. You know, how do you describe the kind of romance that they're looking for? Uh, so again, all of these things comprise the type of words that our readers are looking for when describing the kind of book that they want. So how do we identify target keywords? Well, one of the strategies I like to do is I like to start with pen and paper. Um, and I will break up into those four categories that we talked about. If it's nonfiction, I'm doing pain points and process, results and solutions, emotions and the reason why, and of course, demographics. How do you describe the people? Um, once I have those four columns, I will then start to write as many different things that I can think of that fill or describe all the different ways of pain points, all the different results, all the different emotions, and all the different demographics. And so it can start to look something like this, where I have a giant nonfiction list of the four. Okay, uh, now disregard the orange boxes for now, we'll get back to those. But as I create this list, I'm now 
going to start to look into whether or not these are good. Uh, and we'll get to that in a second. But let's look at fiction. Again, I'm going to do the same thing uh, for fiction. However, in this one, I do like to split it into five instead of the four we talked about. And the, the extra one is a uh, plot theme. Uh, I think this can be important for certain genres because, say, for example, it's post-apocalyptic. Cool. But what kind of post-apocalyptic? Is it zombie? Is it bacteria? Is it disease? Is it weather related? Is it, you know, um, fire and brimstone? Uh, I mean, all of those things are very important. Um, and with themes as well, you could have a wartime book, right? The say it's World War II is in the background, but is the theme about, you know, women picking up the slack for the men who are, you know, overseas? Is it, is the theme about the war separating uh, the love interest? So again, I think that's a very important one to add when you're trying to generate ideas. Um, this is just to kind of talk about those settings and time periods that we discussed earlier. As you can see, I have different time periods from Victorian to, uh, I guess we'll call it um, Middle Ages to Western to uh, modern character types of roles. We got the billionaire, you know, we've got um, we've got Amish, we've got uh, paranormal, and of course, you know, wholesome second chance romance. Plot themes: Is it summer romance? Is it uh, you know? A battle between two love interests? Is it war-torn love? Is it a uh, culturally sensitive time period that is drawn into this romance that maybe other people do not think uh, should happen? And so that's the theme of what's here. But as you can see, uh, each one of these immediately draws upon the emotion of what we're to expect. Uh, special situations, again, we talked about, um, you know, wartime, survival, historical, kidnapping, and then talking about the different romances from wholesome to hot and steamy. So from this, I'll start to generate my fiction list of phrases. And again, I'm coming up with as many different ways that I can come up with terms that help to describe off of these five different areas. Okay, so now that we've generated a whole bunch of keyword ideas, the next thing I like to do is I like to go through and look for what makes a good keyword. Okay, so just because you came up with it does not mean that it's actually a good one for the market. In order to know whether or not a keyword is, is good, uh, there's three things you should answer. The first is, uh, do shoppers actually type in that word or phrase? The second is, do shoppers actually buy books that show up for those words and phrases? And the third is, are these words too competitive? Okay, you don't want to try to beat out or compete with Stephen King. So we need to look and understand, can we rank better for it? One way that you can do this is that you can go in to Amazon, you can start typing in some of these terms. And if Amazon tries to guess at what you're going to put in after that, then it's a good chance that that term is definitely being typed into Amazon by their shoppers. This auto suggestion system is there to kind of help you help shoppers um, find ideas based off of previous purchases. So you can look at this and see that, yep, Doom Space Marine is definitely a, a thing that somebody typed in once. And, and who knows, maybe it's lots of people. Maybe it's a very popular one. It's popular enough, that Amazon wants to try to suggest it to you as you're typing. So we kind of have an idea of whether or not a term does get typed in. The second thing is we want to try to figure out if the term actually makes sales. So if you go to Amazon and you type it into Amazon and hit search, go ahead and look at the first couple of books that show up. You can scroll down to that book's sales page. You can take the Amazon bestseller rank, which is the one that I have highlighted, and you can put it into a free calculator that we have online. Um, just type in like Kindle calculator and that calculator will pop up on Google. And you can put that ABSR in there click here, and then you can find out how many sales occurred uh, that day for that book. So if you're looking at all these books and they're making lots of, of sales, then it's a good indication that that keyword is benefiting uh, the book. If those books are making no sales, then understand that maybe people are typing it in, but for some reason they're either A, not buying, or B, there's not enough people typing that in, and so that keyword is probably not helping those book sales. And finally, we have whether or not keywords are too competitive. Now, if a keyword is 
this is kind of a bit of a subjective thing. You might want to look at those books that show up for that keyword and ask yourself, hey, you know, are these authors famous? Is the book cover amazing? How many reviews do they have? And how good are the grades? And so you're just really wanting to look at some of these things and figure out, all right, yeah, I can beat those books or no, these things are crushing it. And uh, so I now know that this is probably too competitive for, for what I'm doing. Now, you can simplify this. We do have our software, Publisher Rocket, um, that answers both one, two, and three. Um, in our keyword search feature, it brings up the keywords that people have typed into Amazon. Um, and it will even tell you the average amount of money that those books are, are earning that show up for that keyword. But the one over here, that I think this one's the most important one, which is one where we can actually tell you how many people per month have typed in that keyword. So now you can look and say, ah, you know, that's, that's not a real, that's not a bad keyword that actually gets people. And finally, number three is where we've actually taken the comp competitiveness and looked at it and created a score from one to a hundred with one being easy and a hundred being super hard. So now you know that, hey, um, fantasy and science fiction, that's pretty hard, but fantasy alchemist is a lot easier. But darn, you know, now I know that people aren't typing in fantasy alchemist. But if you have Rocket, it's going to save you time. If you don't, we have all these processes that you can do in order to have a better understanding. I think that's most important. Just sitting down and guessing at keywords can really hinder your discoverability. So use the process that we talked about, and you can start to answer those three questions on your own with or without Rocket, okay? So let's look at examples of keywords and actions, okay? I'm gonna use some of the data that we pulled from Rocket so you can see how just slight changes in the words can result in much uh, better situations, all right? Say, for example, you're writing a book on parenting. Great, there are a lot of books that, that are going for parenting, 24,000 to be exact. And out of those, uh, yeah, there's money being made for the ones that show up for parenting. A lot of searches, but man, that is ridiculously competitive. Now, if we use some of the things we learned on how to come up with nonfiction keywords, we can start to niche down. We can start to have specific demographics like parenting teenage girls or parenting teenage boys. We can go even further and go to a, an age group, parenting toddlers. Notice that you know there's a lot more opportunity there. While there aren't 3,000 searches per month, this is only one of many keywords you can go for, and you have a much better situation than showing up. My favorite indication here from the, from the list is parent ADHD. I think this is hilarious because um, is it that the parents have ADHD or is it that people didn't actually use uh, appropriate grammar when typing this in? And what you're going to find out is we shoppers never use appropriate grammar most of the time. We don't write in full sentences. So it's probably they started typing in parent. And then they added like parenting children with ADHD, but they just abbreviated it as such. And so now you have it that you have 120 searches per month. So obviously there are a lot of people typing that in um, and 28 competition score. And my favorite is how to parent a strong-willed child. Uh, if you have a strong-willed child, you know how important that book is. I've got one of those. Um, and again, that's a niche that exists. So if you are writing a book or you're, and by the way, I should have started by saying that I like doing this before I start writing a book because it can help me to understand who I'm writing for. And in this case, I may have started the process by thinking, I'm gonna write a book on parenting. And then you realize, wow, I would have to be the best writer on parenting ever or something or be a really good marketer to beat out this. But if I start to focus maybe on one demographic or one particular pain point, uh, you know, or even the demographic of the reader, like how to parent for those who don't have time, right? I can now really start to get in front of existing markets and make a mark. Whereas if I didn't, I'd get lost. Uh, we can go into science fiction. In this case, how do you describe the type of science fiction? Well, if you type in science fiction or sci-fi military, those, yeah, get a lot of searches, but they're really hard uh, to get in front of. But now we start to get into space marines and even more so space marine bug hunt. I pretty sure if you're a sci-fi fan, you know exactly what space marine bug hunt means. There's a certain type of it. And even though there are only 124 people per month that type it in, I think that the conversion rate on this is actually really high. Uh, if I type it in and I see the kind of book I want to see, uh, you better believe that it got. As a matter of fact, all of these books got, got a purchase from me. That's my kind of uh, sci-fi military. 
And we already talked about wizards, warlocks, mages, sorcerers, magicians, and enchanters. And as you can see, uh, mage is a much better situation than, say, wizard. Um, and you may be questioning, wait, why is the average earnings $18? Well, that's because a lot of the books that show up are free. Um, so you may not want to try to compete with a whole bunch of free books. Uh, a lot of you may be scrat you know, scratching your head, why would somebody do that? Well, one of the tactics that a lot of online uh, authors like to do is if they write a series, they'll make the first book free. So that way, when you read the first book, because why not, uh, if you like it, of course, you're going to pay for the second and the third and the fourth. And that's where they're trying to kind of bring them in. So this is obviously one of those that, that at the time of, of creating this had a lot of free books showing up in that search term, which again, I, I would I would stay clear of those um, if you're trying to do a paid book, because you're going to have to really blow those free books away in order to benefit from it. Um, and you can go even further. Um, one of the specific examples I like to bring up is our Victorian second chance romance, or even more so, second chance romance with baby. Again, this is one of those situations where you're probably saying, wait, what the? Oh, internet, you're terrible. Um, no, no, no. What this is, and again, I think the psychology behind it, is that somebody typed in second chance romance. And this is what we do a lot, is that when we're on Amazon, we'll type something in, we'll quickly look at the search results, like what Amazon presents us, and if we don't see exactly what we're looking for, well then, all right, we'll go back up to the search box and we'll add a couple more words to help get it to what we're kind of looking for. Uh, so in this case, somebody typed in second chance romance. And let me tell you, if you type that in, you're gonna see a lot of hot and steamy type books. But the person was thinking to themselves, I want this to be a book about a woman who finds love again, but the love interest is okay with her being a single mother, okay? And so at last moment, they come up with baby, as in she has child. And just that term, just those five words tells us exactly what kind of book this is, what the theme is, what the, what the plot is going to be. Um, even more so, the character roles and types. And if you just add in the word Victorian, I could probably tell you the whole book in a nutshell. Victorian Second Chance Romance Baby. Uh, somehow the love interest leaves or dies mother is alone in a Victorian age where she's looked at as a charlatan for having a child without a husband. All of society looks down upon her except for one man who is interested and maybe she can find love again as she fights against society that looks down on her. And that's just from six words. So as you can see, the shoppers understand these things and they will add to a phrase in order to help Amazon show them the right books, okay? And finally, we have like different ways of talking about romance from billionaire, millionaire, alpha male, possessive alpha male, rich man romance. And as you can see, millionaire is a lot easier than say billionaire, which is probably an overdone um, trope these days, but I'll just leave it at that. So once you have those lists, like we talked about, and you've done those things to check to see, all right, do people type it in? Do books make sales? And also, the um also is it too competitive you can start to find the right terms and you can start circling them and when you have these phrases these can comprise of the seven kindle keyword boxes that you put them into okay and that's a big part of getting indexed is that um when you have your book your words you can put them in the seven boxes okay or you can put it in your title and subtitle and they play a very important role in helping amazon excuse me helping Amazon to say, you know what, this book is a really good book uh, for this keyword phrase and that we should send it or we should show it to the shoppers, all right? So just to kind of give a quick recap, we talked about how, how Amazon uses keywords. Oh, we talked about how authors should go about creating their initial lists like you see at the top here. Then we talked about how to verify which ones of these are good keywords or bad keywords. And then finally, the most important use of these keywords is either in title, subtitle, or the seven Kindle keyword boxes that you see on the bottom. Uh, one important thing to note is that in each one of those boxes, you're allowed 50 characters. That's like letters and spaces, right? So 50 letters and spaces total. Uh, one question that a lot of people ask is, should I just put alien attack and leave it at that? Or should I put alien attack, planetary, and brink of human, and all these other phrases, like cram them into one box? And what we found was is that we did a major test uh, with a whole bunch of books and we found that 
when you put more words into those boxes, Amazon will show your book in more phrases, okay? Uh, however, though, the initial rankings for your book will actually decrease. So my recommendation is that you, if there are, say, uh, three or four phrases that you absolutely love that truly represent your book, then put them in, in to the four boxes by themselves. Then for the rest of the three, take the other words and use up those 50 characters. And I think this gives you the best balance uh, for the two. All right. So this covers basically our, our um, choosing your keywords and indexing. And then specifically for, for um, rankings, one of the most important things I think is an author should use the opportunity to make sure that it, when Amazon shows your book for that keyword, that your book truly fits the keyword and the shopper mentality. Here's a question I have for you. I show you this cover and this title. How many of you guys, and maybe if you've read this author, maybe you know, but how many of you could tell me exactly what to expect from this book? Is it a romance? Is it a, is it a Western? Is it Civil War? Are those ramparts? Are those fireworks? Is this just drama? Is this educational? Is it a man out in the wild? Is it survival? We don't know. We really can't say. And so, and in terms, this is actually under Western romance. Uh, and now I'm going to put it where I found it on Amazon. And notice that the top book looks like Western romance. The second book could be Western romance. Hitch, who knows? Um, and then the final one, we're not sure. I tell you, the top one's probably going to get a lot of clicks because it fits what I'm looking for. And so I want to explain this, this phenomenon uh, between... The, the books, because if I type in Western romance and I see something where I can't figure out if it really is the kind of Western romance I want, I'm not going to click on it. And I think this is really important because Amazon is looking to see what we click on. They want to present the right books. And if people don't click on the book or they don't purchase the book, then obviously it's not the right book to show. And so that book will drop in the rankings. Or if it is, it will increase the rankings. And one of the phenomenon we found in Amazon is, is that when they find a book doing really well on a certain keywords, they, they choose to show it in more keywords and more keywords and more keywords and then in better rankings. And that's when books really stick. That's why sometimes you'll type something into Amazon and you'll start seeing the same book show up. It's because that book is doing well and Amazon wants to get it in front of more people that they think are good fits. So let's go over this process just a bit. Um, I think it's very important to have what I call a symbiotic relationship between your cover, title, and subtitle, all right? I am a shopper, and I go to Amazon, and I type in Lit RPG Game Lit, which is another one of my favorite types of books. It's a style of fantasy that usually is centered around somebody being stuck in a video game. And so now they've got to play the video game. Sometimes it's in real life, like if they die, they die. Or sometimes they're trying to cultivate points, like it's um, World of Warcraft style. But the point is, is that I type this in, and in my mind, I want to look at books that make me feel like it is a game lit, lit RPG type of book, okay? So when I do this, I'm now going to scroll, my eyes are going to go from, from the book covers, and I'm going to look until I see a book cover that exemplifies the kind of book I'm looking for, okay? Now, when I find one that could be it, I'm then going to shift my eyes over and I'm going to look at the title and the subtitle. Now, it's very important for authors that if I can't figure out if this is my kind of lit RPG game lit based off of the cover, title, and subtitle, I will not purchase the book. I won't even click. I will keep scrolling until I see it. Or I'll go right up to that search bar at the top and I'll add a couple more words until Amazon finally shows me a cover, title, and subtitle that makes me feel like this is a good fit for my kind, of, my kind of reading. And then when I finally find that one, I'm gonna click and the most important thing I'm gonna go to is that book description. This is your last chance. This is the most in crucial part to convince me that yes, this is my kind of book, okay? Now, a very important thing is, is that we talked about those keywords and all those phrases. I think that when creating your book description, using those words and phrases are very important because if you're writing a fiction book and you don't 
tell me the settings. You don't tell me kind of something about the character roles. You're not using my kind of words uh, that I described. Then I'm probably just going to think maybe it's a good sci-fi book. Maybe it's a good litter PG book. And I don't know. Um, saying something like, you know, space battles, uh, you know, above the atmosphere of Earth, go on and on. Okay, cool. Or if you talk about an ageless intergalactic war that has come to the doorstep of, of Earth and, you know, the Earth's defense force is the last step to annihilation. Notice words like annihilation, intergalactic, you know, these are things that as a sci-fi military reader, I want to hear. So you can use those lists to help create much better book descriptions and more importantly, ones that help me to say, yes, this is my kind of sci-fi book. So in essence, one thing I like to think is that when I look at a title, a cover, a title, and subtitle for nonfiction, I, it's really important for me to understand these three things. Who is this for? What is it about? And what will it do for me? If I look at the cover title and subtitle and I can't answer those three things, then you're failing. Um, that's not to be me. That's just a very true fact. You can do all these great marketing tactics. You can do book promotion sites. You can do advertisement. But if you can't convince them just from the cover title and subtitle who this is for, what it is about, and what will it do for me, you will lose that person because they won't click to read your book description. Uh, one thing I like to say is if you confuse, you lose. So a great thing that I like to test is when I finally have my cover title and subtitle, I'll present it to somebody who doesn't know what I'm working on and I'll ask them to describe, hey, who do you think this book is for? What do you think it's about? And what do you think it will do for you? And if they can't say those things, then that's a good indication that something needs to be tweaked because there's confusion as to those three important things. And that's for nonfiction. For fiction, on the other hand, is, is it my kind of genre? And does it fit my description? Okay. Am I looking, you know, when I describe the kind of story I want, um, does this exemplify that, right? Does, if I talk about a single mother um, uh, in the prairie, right? Does that cover title and subtitle make me feel like, yeah, this is going to be about a single mother in the prairie, right? Or, or not. Same, you know, we'll get with the hitch one. If I type in Western romance, does that make me feel like that's a Western romance? It's a little ambiguous. So a couple of examples of where things went wrong. Uh, somebody here created this book. And by the way, I, I've, I've been in a couple of these where somebody in the crowd either knew the person who wrote the book. And I, I take the name off um, on some of these just because. So if it's yours, then nobody will know. Um, but in this case, this person wrote this book on the, uh, the essential writing structure. Intrigue, inform, and inspire your readers. Cool. Uh, their keywords were how to write a blog post, how to write speeches, how to write uh, an essay, and apparently I had a typo in here. But the, the point is, is that we don't really know what this is for. We don't know who this is for. This person wrote this book, and they tried to write for all things writing. Well, if I type in Amazon how to write blog posts, would I select this book? Probably not. Uh, why? I'd much rather select a book that is specifically about, about online blog writing. If I am here to learn how to write a speech, you better believe I'm going to choose the one that's actually about writing speeches and not just writing anything. So in this case, this author tried to represent everything and wholly represented nothing and, and truly lost in, the, in all of their marketing efforts because it's not clear who this is for, what is it about, and what will they get out of it, okay? Also too, by the way, well, one little trick that I like to do with Amazon is that when you're looking at your book cover, it's very important to shrink down the size of your image until what it would look like on Amazon and then look at your cover and ask, ask yourself what it looks like. Uh, a lot of people find it funny is that on this one, when you shrink this cover down, that typewriter actually starts to look like a, a, a toilet. Um, and and uh, so the impression you're giving is, and also, by the way, the writing structure, the, the title, because it's white on light blue, and when you shrink it down the way it looks on Amazon, that white structure, that writing structure starts to be hard to read. So all you see is kind of a toilet and nothing else. Um, and that's not going to grab the eyes. So, so a little trick on your covers. We come to Hitch. Here it is. Now you know that it's a 
it's listed under Western romance. But here's the thing, the book is not about a romance. Uh, it's actually about a little kid who's dropped off at a train station, not sure why his mom doesn't want him anymore, and he's coming to meet his uncle Hitch. That's it. Um, maybe there's some kind of romance in there, but nope. So this book, although has a lot of reviews and has even more today, this book is being placed in an area where it shouldn't, and the cover title and subtitle are ambiguous as to exactly what to get, what to expect from this. Now, maybe C.J. Petit, or Pettit, uh, however you pronounce it, is famous for his genre, uh, his or her genre, and that could be a reason as to why people pick up on it. But the search capability in Amazon is not helping C.J. sell books because it's wholly confusing about what this is, and I'm not going to click on this to investigate. I think that CJ's losing a lot of potential customers. And obviously, CJ's written a very good book. Um, I think it's now up to like 400 reviews. And so the person did some marketing, but they're not benefiting from their search. And that's because title, subtitle, and book cover do not represent what kind of genre this is and what kind of story to expect. Here, on the other hand, is a great example. Um, you know, we talked about Lit RPG and Gamelet. The author has the cover. It looks like a good fantasy. It also shows me that it's a female protagonist, um, which that's you know picked up a lot in 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 fantasies. More people are looking for uh, female protagonists, strong female characters. So I get that. But how do you put elements in the title and and book cover that help me to know that this is potentially somebody who's stuck in a video game or who's cultivating points? And so in this case, the person made a subtitle that says a lit RPG and game lit adventure. Huh, there we go, took the guesswork. Now I know exactly what to expect from this. So a lot of people say your subtitle is something that you may want to refrain from um, for fiction. My recommendation is that if you can't fully show in your title and your book cover what it is, then just use your subtitle as that extra thing to help them understand what the book truly is, okay? Um, this isn't about keyword stuffing in the subtitle. This is more about helping that author know that they're in the right spot, that this is lit RPG and this is game lit, which game lit is a sub genre of lit RPG. Uh, there's a whole bunch more of sub genres under lit RPG alone. But lit RPG fans know the difference between game lit, Wu Fong, cultivation, a whole bunch more. Okay. And, and like we talked about too, when the person finally selects on your book, having a book description that helps them to say, yes, this sounds amazing, uh, is extremely important because now the person found your book, they clicked on your book, and then they decided to buy your book. And you just told, that shopper just told Amazon that when somebody types in that keyword, that book is the book that, that they bought. And therefore Amazon will reward the book by showing it either higher in the rankings or more often. And this is where books grow digitally. All right, you can't take a bad book cover and convince strangers on Amazon to trust what you're doing. You can't take a good book with good book cover and have a poor book description and expect Amazon to help you sell it. Uh, but when you have this beautiful relationship between them and you've, got, you've given Amazon the initial keywords to put you in, you'll start to see this digital growth that will allow you to get your book in front of more readers. So I know that was a lot of information um, and I know that we have a bunch of questions coming in. So I think, uh, Maddie, we can kind of jump into the questions and we can use that time to um, answer those. Is okay. that okay? Sure. Sounds great. I'm looking across the screen. I'm seeing all the heads blown off the top of people's heads because I think that you opened a whole new world to a lot of people. I know we have some uh, um, experts who have already gone through a lot of this, but when you sit here and you look at at, and you listen to you speak, you're like, oh, well, that makes sense. Of course, that's logical. But when you're in the, the thick of it and you're trying to upload your book onto Kindle and there are so many things, or Amazon, and there's so many things going on, it's, it's hard not to, if you don't know it, to step back and to pay attention to these things. So I, I hope everybody um, got as much out of that first part as, as I got. So, um, so we do have some questions. One, one of the questions is, when you're listing those 
keywords, those seven keywords in Amazon, does the order that you list them in um, have any uh, priority or any weight? Um, no, as a matter of fact, what we found is Amazon will take all the different words inside of one box and they'll rearrange them and they'll pluralize them and they'll find all these opportunities. So you may have a total of say 20 words inside of those seven boxes, right? Well, you could be indexed showing up for 120 because Amazon found all these combinations from it. They're just using it to help them kind of figure things out. Um, and for those who don't know, we did a test of over 120 books and we changed keywords and we had this crawler actually find what happened to books and it was, it was awesome. So we were able to finally say that that's kind of how Amazon uses is they're using the combinations of words and pluralization. So if you have, say for example, it's Dragon War, right? You put Dragon War, well, you'll also show up for War Dragon, um, you know, or War Dragons or Dragon Wars, uh, you know, and things like that. Okay. And then, um, so Catherine said, um, on the competition score, when you were talking about that matrix, um, is a lower score good? Yes, lower score is good. One being easy and 100 being impossible. Okay. Um, let's see. I'm going to launch my new book, first one next week. I'm trying to figure out what Amazon takes into consideration in rating a book, which we talked a little bit about. Um, it's not just how many stars. It's also how the stars are earned. It's logarithms or algorithms, isn't it? How to, how to get my book sales and ranking ratings to be more valuable to Amazon? That's a pretty broad question, but can you um, opine? Yes, so um, we're talking about Amazon reviews, right? Okay. Um, yeah, ratings, yes. Ratings, right. So there's actually a couple of different types of reviews. There's three uh, when it comes to Amazon. There's verified reviews, unverified reviews, and editorial reviews. Uh, verified reviews are ones where the person has purchased your book and then goes to Amazon and leaves a review. An unverified review is one where they haven't purchased your book or they're logged into an Amazon account that didn't purchase your book and they leave a review. Okay. Uh, interesting enough is that verified reviews are definitely more important uh, or more powerful in Amazon's my eyes than an unverified review. But for those two reviews, you have to abide by a lot of different rules with Amazon in order to make sure that they stay there, okay? Uh, first off is that it can't be a family member who tries to leave a review. Amazon's crazy hardcore about that. They know uh, you've been in the same house, you've had the same address as them, you use the same credit card, something of that matter, but they know. Uh, another thing that comes with uh, reviews as well is that if they have any indication or belief that this person either is illegitimate shouldn't be leaving a review. Maybe they leave a review for something every 10 minutes, you know? They're hardcore about weeding those out. Now, finally, there are gonna be times where somebody who isn't a family member, maybe they're acquaintance, or maybe they're just a fan, uh, and they leave a review and Amazon rejects it. That happens. Um, to explain this phenomenon, Amazon created an automatic system. It, it's just this automated system that looks at a bunch of criteria, and when you go above a threshold, they'll just remove the review, okay? So that's why sometimes it works where the review got through and then sometimes it doesn't. You never know because it could be a combination of things that heighten it to a point. Uh, sometimes too, humans will also go through and look at reviews and remove them. Uh, but the key is, is that they're very protective of those. They've actually sued companies that were selling reviews. Uh, so Amazon's pretty hardcore about protecting that. But again, Verified reviews have more weight uh, than unverified reviews. Now, the third reviews, which is something I think that authors don't take advantage of enough, is uh, editorial reviews. One very important thing about verified and unverified reviews is you cannot incentivize the review. You can't tell somebody, hey, I will give you something, but you have to give me a review. Uh, you can send your book for free to somebody in hopes that they'll leave a review, but you can't say, I'll send you a book, but you have to leave a review. It's very important to them. Uh, you can't do anything that says, hey, you can enter my con, or in order to enter my contest, you have to leave a review, but you can say, hey, enter my contest, and if you leave a review, that's cool. Those are very important. But here's the cool part. Editorial reviews, anybody can leave that. Your, your mom, your dad, your friends, your, your spouse, uh, a blogger, somebody who you paid to read your book. Um, editorial reviews are your opportunity to put anything you want. 
And you do this through your Author Central account. Uh, you need to create an Author Central account if you haven't, and then you can go in there and you can tweak your editor reviews. My recommendation is that if you're in fiction, you should reach out to other fiction writers in your genre and ha have them just give you a one sentence or two sentence blurb on what they think about your book. And then more importantly, you put their name and then you put, if they're a best-selling author, right? Best-selling author of whatever genre it is. Because to the shopper, most, and what we've been monitoring this, most don't read the review. They just look to see who said it. So there needs to be a quantifier to help the person to understand that that's a legitimate author in this genre or industry that believes in your writing. Uh, same thing with blogs. You can find that there are a lot of professional reviewers out there. Uh, like, for example, if you're a science fiction person, you should check out topscifibooks.com. Um, are they some amazing organization? No, but if, if the lead editor of topscifibooks.com has good things to say about your book, that carries so much more than if the website's called johnrow.com. John Rowe of johnrow.com said that this is a good book. Um, but this is an opportunity for you to collect reviews from peers, friends, bloggers, et cetera, and put whatever you want. And Amazon allows that. And that's a very important space. So if you haven't created editorial reviews for your book, you're missing out on a very easy uh, way to show legitimacy and build more faith in the potential shopper. Okay, great. So um, Dave, if, if you never worked for Deloitte and Touche or don't have a military analytics background, um, maybe you could look to Publisher Rocker, Rocket. Um, and it, I know you touched on that, and this is something that you do. If, if you're an author and you want to spend your time writing um, and maybe doing other things, blogging and going out, and maybe analytics is not your thing, um, what, what kinds of things or resources can you offer them? Can they find in Kindlepreneur or Publisher Rocket? Yeah, so one thing that's, um, when I first started teaching about keywords and everything, uh, I used Excel sheets um, and data tracking, and I tried to teach people how to use those. And Excel sheets aren't, aren't, aren't exactly a fan favorite of many people, uh, which is totally understandable. Um, so we basically packaged everything into Publisher Rocket uh, to make it quick and easy for people to, and that's what we saw today was just keyword feature. Uh, you can use that to see the words people type in, how many people type it in, how much money, competition score, how many books are competing for it, all of that information with a couple of clicks of a button. But I think another important one that I like too is our category feature. Um, what's interesting is, is that there are 14,000 categories on Amazon. And, but when you go to publish your book for the first time, there is that pop-up that allows you to select a couple categories. Those actually aren't Amazon categories. Those are called BISACs, which is an international standard code. Um, it helps Amazon to then figure out what Amazon category they should put you in. Uh, there were only 4,700 BISACs, but like I said, there's 14,000 Amazon categories. Um, so one of the things that we did on Publisher Rock is we put all 14,000 categories in there and you can quickly see all of them. There's filters and everything like that. But my favorite part is that you can look and see how many books that day you need to sell in order to be the number one bestseller in that category. So it takes out the guesswork. Um, there's also a process for you to change up your categories, add more than 10 categories. Um, so you're not stuck with just two, but a lot of opportunity there. And you can either click around and try to discover what's out there or you can just find it. But I, I think the biggest thing is, is that our goal with Rocket was to help kind of pull back the curtain and let authors see what's going on. You can check on competition. You can see how much money other books are making. Um, you can develop ads, choose the right categories. A lot of it's just being able to see what's going on. Okay. Um, and we're going to put all that information as we move forward, but we have a few more questions. Um, so this is from Karen Walker. Uh, when you upload to KDP, you upload seven keywords. I know you, uh, you can use phrases, but let's say for instance, that I want to be in the cozy mystery animal category. Should I use a keyword of cat or cat pet animal to cover all the bases? Um, one more related question. If mystery is part of one keyword, should I only use it in one keyword? How do I choose the right book category? Wow, this is good questions. How do word selection change depends on categories? Oh, those, I'm sorry, those, let's forget that, those. So one more related question. If mystery is part, uh, part of one keyword, should I only use it in one keyword? Yeah, there's 
so there's a couple of things is, is that Amazon actually says that if you, if the word's in the title or subtitle, then you shouldn't use it as one of your keywords. My take on it is we actually found it doesn't hurt, uh, nor does it help. But if you're trying to process, like do the combination of words, like we talked about, I put it in there. Um, for example, say, say the title of my book is dragon war. Um, am I going to refrain from putting the word dragon in the keywords? Probably not. I'm just going to put it in there. Uh, you don't get penalized if it is, if dragon is in your title and dragon is in one of your seven Kindle keywords or something like that. Um, my take on it is I don't refrain from putting in words because I know I put the word somewhere else. Now, if you notice that the word mystery is in all seven of your boxes, okay, maybe that's overkill. Um, but I, I wouldn't go through and stop what you're doing just because you realize you said the word already. Uh, there's 50 characters per seven boxes and your title and subtitle. Uh, just, I, I wouldn't take the time to try to dig into that. Okay. So um, also, I think there was a really important question at the end of it, or at least the person was alluding to. Um, back in the day, there used to be certain categories that you could not get added to unless you used what they called one of those keywords in order to trigger it. Okay. Um, and they, they do have this thing, a page, I think if you just type into Google, something like Amazon keywords for categories or something like that, uh, they do have a list of these. Here's the thing though. Uh, you no longer have to do that. Um, all you have to do is there's a process we have it on our, if you just go to like YouTube or you just type in how to change your Amazon categories, I have a video showing you exactly how you can contact Amazon. Literally, you can get them to call you, uh, tell them what categories you want to be added to and they'll take care of it. And if you happen to select one of those categories that needs one of those secret keywords, um, no problem. Like you told them to change it. The whole purpose of the keyword was if you don't tell them to change it, the hope is because you use that keyword, Amazon will automatically put you in that category. Not all the time though. So I think that was one of the questions the person was alluding to. And I would say that so long as you're requesting to change your categories, you do not need to have a certain keyword in order to get in that category. So um, I have a question about the, su the subtitles. So you see subtitles a lot in series and in science fiction and in certain genres, maybe more so than others. Does, does the use of a, a subtitle um, differentiate between traditionally published and independently published books that are primarily marketed on Amazon, in your opinion? I would say that back in the day, uh, publishing companies used to shy away from subtitles a lot. Like it wasn't a big thing. Um, also too, back in the day, a lot of publishing companies looked down on self-publishing, but that is not the case in today. Uh, publishing companies have gotten a lot smarter about Amazon. Uh, I would say that a good like seven, eight, nine years ago, they used to be like, oh, we don't need that. But now that they see 70% of the market is Amazon, they're like, ah, oh, we need to figure this out. Um, and so subtitles are becoming a bit more important. Uh, if you think of just the bookstore, like we talked about, right? I don't need to know the subtitle because I know it's in the aisle for fantasy. Right, I know that it's in the aisle for for this or and so forth. Um, however, though, I am. It's now important for somebody on Amazon to quickly answer those questions, like we talked about, to be able to figure out if they're going to click to read the book description. Uh, I've been uh, paid a consultant to a lot of publishing companies, especially over the past year, and a lot of them are taking this very seriously. Uh, they're also getting heavily involved in Amazon ads because they're seeing the benefit to setting those up. So. Uh, kind of answering two questions there and stating it, but yes, publishing companies are definitely coming around to using subtitles more often than they used to just because of the digital component, but also publishing companies are really becoming more um, receptive to changing some of the things that you, they used to not do in order to benefit from the digital component. Okay. And um, it, you, you touched on Amazon ads and I know that could be a whole day seminar on um, Amazon ads. But if you had uh, th uh, maybe three pieces of advice you could give to um, our attendees here today about using uh, Amazon ads, what would that be? To getting the most from their Amazon ads. Go to amscourse.com. Uh, I created an absolutely free course, everything I know on Amazon ads, showing you over the shoulder as I create ads for both fiction and nonfiction. And it is not one of those courses where you have to pay for an advanced course. It's everything I got. Okay, well, there you go. There's one. Very, very succinct. I like it. Just okay. Point. So um, Larry says, some time ago, I followed your directions to get my first book in 10 categories instead of just two. Is that still available? Yes. As a matter of fact, you can now, and this is just for us, but you can now go beyond 10. Um, we don't exactly know what the max is. Uh, so I don't say, I always say 10 plus is the way I like to put it now, but absolutely. 
Okay, and where can people find that? It says, is that? Yeah, um, if you just go to YouTube and you type in how to change or add Amazon category, book categories. Um, otherwise, while I answer the next question, I can just pull that up and then put it in the chat for everybody. Okay, and I'm looking for th this one. I was um, looking at here. Okay, um, well, I'm looking for that one. Uh, also, in your experience, what is the th what are the three biggest money wasters for authors? Ooh, um, you know, it's money is one thing. One of the things I definitely like to talk about is time wasters. Uh, I think time is money uh, for a lot of people. You know, how much is uh, yep AMS course.com yeah it, it, the ams course.com by the way three one redirects to uh that long one you see it's just an easy one for me to say on video just ams course.com instead of courses.kindlepreneur.com forward slash courses forward slash ams um sorry, all right let's see oh wait no that's sending it to everyone there we go sorry oh, all right so there's the video for it i'm sorry what was the question um, well, let, let's move on. So this one is, yes, my question is about publishing, or we were talking about the, the time wasters and, uh, yes. yeah, and then we'll go on to this. Yeah. Um, a lot of things, one thing that I like to tell authors is there's, there's 30,000 different ways to, to sell a book. Uh, there are 30,000 plus different methods, tactics, good Lord knows how many, uh, social media things there are. And the fact of the matter is, is authors can't do everything. Um, there is absolutely no way for an author to write a book, write their next book, improve their writing, uh, hone their writing skills, right? And then on top of that, do all these different marketing tactics and things like that. So what I like to tell authors is the biggest, the best thing you can do is choose a couple and do them really good. I think you'll get way more out of it than if you try to dabble in 50 different things. And I think one of the biggest things I see a lot is people dabble in 50 things and they really don't do anything well, but they work really hard to get those 50 things and they don't see any benefits or results. And so in essence, they're just spinning their wheels, going in circles and getting nothing done. Where you see authors really crush it is where they stick with one thing and they say, you know what, this is the thing I'm going to do. Say, for example, it's Amazon ads, right? I am going to learn Amazon ads. I, and if, if, if the first couple of times I do it, it's, it's not working, I'm gonna figure out why. And I think that's a really important kind of mentality instead of just pivoting away from something and saying, all right, I'm gonna try in this, I'm gonna try in that. Because the people who are really good are the people who took that time and, and, and tried to harness and learn and, and shall we say become that top 1% because they stuck with it, okay? I think that's when people get so much more out of everything. Otherwise, if you keep pivoting from point to point to point, all you're doing is spending time in something and then going back to square one on something else and then spending time in that and going back to square one on something else. And you just keep doing this to the point that nothing really comes out of it. Uh, what I think is great is on this first book, I am going to master that thing. I'm going to do that one thing and I'm going to stick with it. I'm going to use it well. And then when you finally do, when the second book comes out, great, you got this one skill, let's do another one. And you start to add these as you go. And that's when you start to, to really see some changes. That's when you really start to see even more growth um, and that things are much more manageable and you don't lose sight of what's most important. A great analogy of this is imagine writing a book, right? Uh, you sit down and you write once. Oh, I got... 20 pages into it, and I'm just, ah, no, I'm just, I, I'm going to shift from romance, and I'm going to go to fantasy. I'm going to write, and then you write 20 pages of fantasy, and you start writing in all these, and you never get anything done. Every author that I've worked with, with Orson Scott Card, Ted Decker, um, uh, Brandon Sanderson, uh, you know, these, every one of them has, uh, will tell you that they basically deleted their first million pages, <laughs> or million words. Um but they kept writing over time and they got better and better. And I say the same thing goes with your marketing efforts as well. Stick with something, really learn from it. Uh, don't keep going back to square one because it didn't just work out immediately. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. So, and you talked, you talked, or you touched a little bit on social media are the same keywords that you use for Amazon. Um, do you use those in your social media? Um, and this is our popular hashtags and in Instagram good markers for keywords and tags and other strategies. I mean, how do, how do they relate? 
I'll be the first to tell you, social media is not my strong suit. Um, I'm just not a social media guy. I'm not very social, apparently. No. <laughs> um, and and so I can't really speak on that. I my I have a 20 year old daughter, and she makes fun of my lack of knowledge on Instagram. Matter of fact, I, I've been very anti Instagram for a very long time, um, and she now rags on me for finally getting on it. So I can't speak that much about hashtags because I I most of the time I post pictures of my kids and I don't hashtag dad life or any of that stuff. Um, so I, I'll be the first to tell you when I do not think that I'm a specialist on something and that is not one of my areas. Okay. All right. And then, um, I think we have, um, a couple of, um, very direct questions. One was, um, from Lillian. She was wondering if you could give an example of a couple of keywords that would be good for, um, why a science fiction? And then we had one from PJ wondering, um, her book is women's fiction, but it's such a broad title, uh, maybe some options or ways that they could go to come up with some keywords that are more specific or would return uh, more readers. Yeah, I think um, using that that process that we talked about earlier, where you create the, the five columns, and then you start to generate ideas, because uh, talking about YA science fiction, I mean, there there's a lot of different science fiction out there. Um, the YA component is just remembering to use the words that your target market would use. Okay. Um, but you know, uh, so it's really hard to take such a broad subject and be able to, but that exercise of those five things should help you to generate ideas. It's when you're stuck and you're not thinking of those five things and you're trying to come up with words, that's when it gets hard. But if I start asking you to describe all the time periods and settings, all right, post-apocalyptic sci-fi, right? I mean, that's a whole different beast compared to intergalactic war. Um, is this, you know, is this uh, science camp or mutant camp, right? That's science fiction. That's a completely different. The point though is, is that looking at settings and time periods alone, you can start generating a whole bunch of, of ideas and words and phrases. And you just go through those five and you're going to find yourself finding and generating a lot of great ideas and thinking of phrases you never would have thought of. But with this exercise, you'll come up with them. And like I said, too, using those as, as things inside of your book description can really help. I think just using that list can really help you to write a much better uh, book description because now you're thinking of ways to describe the entire story and not just the component you're thinking of. Uh, one tool that I absolutely recommend, by the way, uh, for book descriptions is, let me just get the uh, link here. Uh, we created a free book description generator. Uh, and what it is, is that you might have gone to a bunch of Amazon uh, books and you see that book descriptions like bigger words and bold and they have all this. Well, you can form your description to look the way you want if you know HTML and coding. That sucks for most people. Plus, if you make a mistake, your book description looks like horrible. Uh, so what we did was we generated this free tool where you type in your book description into this, and then you can highlight something and click to make it look the way you want. But the way you see it on this tool is exactly the way it's going to look on Amazon. And when you've got it looking the way you want, go ahead and click get my code um, or generate my code, excuse me. And you can copy and paste that right into Amazon uh, just like that. We don't need your email, We're not asking for it, uh, nothing like that. So you can just enjoy that tool. Uh, one thing we do have that I think is really important is uh, it's one of my favorite things I've created and it's probably one of the most underutilized thing too, is I have a, a free nonfiction and fiction book description blueprint. Uh, it teaches like the anatomy of a good Amazon book description. Uh, one page is for nonfiction, one page is on, on fiction. And that's also located right there on the tool as well. Um, I think that's one of the biggest things that authors kind of miss. They either they don't have the right hook or they write book reports instead of, you know, tantalizing high stakes, you know, book descriptions. And I think that if you use that formula, that layout, I think you can create something that sounds much better. And then you combine it with those keywords and you're going to reach your target audience much better. Okay, great. We have time for hopefully one more question here um, from Catherine. Um, she has a question on a textbook that she's a co-author on. Um, and they have allowed the entire text to be available on Amazon. I've had my own students use the Amazon search feature for free, cite the source, but never buy. Springer has not um, managed the copyright for this text at all. Any suggestions for how to get Amazon to only show a limited preview and to get the full text offline? Hmm. 
Um, so Amazon's only supposed to show fifteen uh, percent in the preview of the text. So I would contact Amazon and be like, "Hey guys, <laughs> your system's wrong here, and if you don't fix it, uh, you're giving away my book for free, and that's not cool." Uh, however, though, there are a lot of sites that are out there uh, that, and here's the thing: there's a lot of piracy. There is piracy. However, though, uh, there are a lot of websites, and be be very careful. Do not. I repeat, do not go to Google and type in your book and put the word free next to it because you're going to find like 10 sites that claim to have your book for free and giving it away for free. Most of those are viruses. They're luring you in to click on it and then, oh, to see it, you got to download this thing. And then when you download it, it just destroys your computer. Or, and this is usually what they do is, oh, well, pay us a couple hundred bucks and we'll send you the, the key that fixes it. Um, so just really be aware of that. I want, I want everybody to be clear. And if you see a website that's claiming it, good chance it's not there. Uh, now that may be different for a textbook. There are a lot of, of students out there that, uh, try to help other students. Um, and maybe they take it and they put it out there. Uh, but just really be aware of that. Just because a website says they have it does not mean they actually have it. Um, as to how to get them to take it down, you can definitely threaten legal uh, action against it. So what if you don't have a quote unquote copyright? The fact of the matter is, is that you have published it, you have proof of date, um, and that if it were to go to court, you usually have more than enough to be able to battle and take them down. Um, but that's also going to be very costly. So the idea is threaten them uh, with the ability of takedown. If you type into Google um, uh, ebook piracy, I have a full article that should show up number one that tells about all the different processes that you can get a website to take it out uh, without bringing in lawyers. I saw that when I was doing my research before we talked. So yeah, I know that article's there too. Okay, okay. great. Um, thank you. I, I have one question. If you're an author and this is all overwhelming to you, <laughs> so um, do you offer, and we know that you have all these free resources, is there, do you offer any consulting services um, or is, can they can they come to you? Can they email you, or is there someone there that they can go to for even if you if they're paid or whatever? Are there any other services available? Um, not at the time. I'm actually I've been really having my head down, um, kind of working on a bunch of deadlines that have been <laughs> piling up <laughs> that I really need to get to. Um, however, though, one of the things I think is really important is if you do go to if you go to uh, kindlepreneur.com in the top right corner, there's a, in the nav bar, there's a start here. And uh, the way that I created that page is that I have not sat down and wrote a book on book marketing. I just haven't. But that page is pretty much the table of contents of exactly the book that I would write. And it links to articles, some mine, some other people's, because sometimes people do it better than me. Um, and it, it sends you to exactly what I think one would need to learn. Uh, so I, I see that as like a free online book. Find, you can also start where you think you are. I break it down into phases, the four phases to, to creating a book, to marketing a book. Um, you can choose the right phase or the right pain point you have, dive in and get the right information. Like I said, sometimes it's me, many times it's other people's, but I think it's the best information out there. So. Okay. And if, if people are interested in hearing more about what you do, um, aside from online, do you do seminars? How do they find out about that? Um, if they're interested in Publisher Rocket, how do they subscribe or purchase? How does that work? Yeah. Um, I go to a bunch of, of seminars. I'll be at Nink uh, here next month. Um, that's Novelist Inc. Uh, but with with everything going on, who knows what that schedule is going to be like. So um, I don't publish that uh, particularly online. Uh, with regards to Publisher Rocket, you could just, um, I think there's a link in there or so. It's actually a one-time uh, fee of $97 and you get all updates and everything. New features. Matter of fact, next week we're coming out with the UK market. That'll be a free upgrade for everybody. So, Great. Okay. Well, um, I thank you so much for sharing all your expertise, your knowledge, for being so generous with that. We appreciate it. We hope you'll come back. Uh, we would love to have that. And uh, I know everybody, you can take a minute and give Dave a round of silent golf applause, Zoom applause. Thanks, guys. And, and again, Maddie, thank you so much for having me here. It's been great. This has been great. Thank you. And hopefully we'll see you again. Bye-bye. Thank you.